We normally begin our worship services with kind of an upbeat praise and worship song, but we're going to begin a little bit different this morning, but with some powerful words, uh, a reminder for us for the new year of 2021, and Amber's going to lead out, the choir will join, and I think these words will be of tremendous encouragement to all of us as we remember that as we go throughout this new year, we are not alone. Amen?
Amen. Well, we're going to continue this morning in uh, our, our Christmas kind of theme, and yet after Christmas, and as you see in the bulletin, it's Christmas in Egypt. Hopefully those of you that are watching online were able to pull down the bulletin. You've looked at it, and maybe some of you even run it off in your printer, and you're able to look at it in that particular way. But we're going to be looking uh, in that particular area, especially uh, leaving Bethlehem and heading into Egypt. Now, as we think of that, I saw a clip that CBN had on the Church of the Nativity where we always go with our groups uh, into that area because one of the first churches built over the birthplace of Christ. Well, how do you know that's the exact place? Well, as they will tell you there historically, uh, those who thought that they would stamp it out actually have done us great service by preserving it, and we knew exactly where it was, and you will see that in this clip. But also there, they mark in that church a place underneath there where they have the bones of many of the children that were killed in the massacre. That's the kind of passage we're going to be on today. But let's first of all watch this little clip about the church in Nativity and uh, what took place there. It's one of the oldest churches in the world, the Church of the Nativity. This is the place where Jesus Christ was born. Professor Kastandi Shamali teaches history at Bethlehem University and is an expert on the Church of the Nativity. The Church of Nativity was built over this place in 326 when Emperor Constantine decided to declare Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. Inside the church, the original columns from the 4th century still stand. We do know that the identification of the site of where Jesus was born already traditionally goes back to the middle of the first century uh, AD at least. In the first century, the Roman Emperor Hadrian destroyed the town of Bethlehem. After he destroyed the town, Hadrian built a temple and planted a grove of trees over the site where Christian pilgrims had come to honor the place where Jesus was born. In fact, this temple, instead of uh, uh, destroying the place, preserved the place. Jerome wrote in 396 A.D., even amongst those who are strangers to the faith, it is known that inside that grotto, he who is adored and glorified by the Christians was born. This is the main entrance into the Church of the Nativity. It's called the Door of Humility because you have to bend down in order to get inside the church. It was originally built by the Crusaders and then altered by the Ottomans in order to keep mounted horsemen out of the church. 1,400 years after Queen Helena built the church, Christian pilgrims still come from around the world. The central place lays inside the grotto. Many believe it's the very cave where Jesus was born. A star marks the exact location. Many crowd down the narrow stairs to get inside the cave. Down below, pilgrims often touch the star and record the moment they got to see the birthplace of Jesus. For many, it's a profound emotional and spiritual experience. What did it mean to be at the birthplace of Jesus? Uh, something I cannot describe. I mean, everything makes sense and no words. I mean, it's difficult. I'm really surprised. Now when I open my Bible, as I do each morning when I'm here and I'm reading, uh, it's, well, now I can picture the places. It's just unbelievable. It's a live stream. Never expected to be here, but it's, just awesome. Father Peter Vasco leads pilgrims to Bethlehem. He says it's especially meaningful during the Christmas season. I think it's an absolute wonderful occasion for pilgrims to come, especially so close to Christmas, uh, to be here to pray at, at the spot where Jesus was born and to bring that prayer back in their own lives. But another event recorded in the Bible took place after Jesus was born. Professor Shamali gave us a rare look underneath the Church of the Nativity. Yes. This is the place where we have the tomb of the innocent children. Mm -hmm. Herod killed around 6,000 children from the whole area in order to kill Jesus Christ. We followed Professor Shamali down to some of the tombs below the church. Here are the tombs of the innocent children. These are the bones of some of the children that we believe were killed by Herod. Another significant event took place just outside Bethlehem. Pastor Steve Corey showed us caves many believe were used by the shepherds on that holy night. 
according to history, shepherds would use these caves to store the sheep during the winter, uh, to store their food in the, in the caves, and also uh, places to live uh, with them. You know, the, the shepherds were very close to their sheep. Those shepherds became the first witnesses to the fulfillment of a prophecy given 700 years before, when Isaiah proclaimed, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Today, that Christmas message is still the same for pilgrims, professors, and pastors. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Bethlehem. Another one of those places we are looking to go back at the end of October, 1st of November, and uh, come along and go with us. We'll let you know later about any deposits. We're not collecting those yet, uh, but we, it's time to make plans as things will begin to open up and they start tours again in March. Some of those brochures are on the front corner down here of the pew, and you can pick that up. Well, as you look at that particular backdrop and you begin to think about the church of nativity there in Bethlehem and the surrounding events, the things that took place, and, of course, the, the Holy Family moving from there uh, by being warned by the angel to go and to make a flight into Egypt. Um, we're going to turn there to that passage today in, he, in um, Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 13, and read uh, through verse uh, 23. So if you would stand, please, as we honor God's Word. <clears throat> It has just spoken about uh, the wise men who have been warned to go back a different way and not to go to Herod. And now when they had departed, the wise men that is, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. And then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth, uh, sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethle Bethlehem and all of its districts from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentations, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For there, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. And then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelled in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you how, of how it just comes alive as we begin to picture in our mind those places and all that took place surrounding the Christmas story and, and those events that took place even in a time afterwards. And Lord, I pray that even today you would not only speak that to us historically and speak it to us biblically, but spiritually and very practically how we can look at this uh, flight into Egypt and we can see how you are working and how you want to work in our lives today. And so, Lord, bless, grant us your favor today. Touch every heart. Stir us uh, to action before you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the entire Christmas experience has been the, a picture of God working his sovereign plan, the fulfillment of scriptures one after another, the messianic line that we've preached about, the genealogies of the royal lineage that came into being, the place of his birth, where that would be, how all of this would be orchestrated to, to come forth of a virgin according to Isaiah 7, 14, uh, and to have everything put into place 
place has just been a testament to God's sovereign will. Now listen, what has that got to do with me? It's the very fact that God has always been working his sovereign will, that we are a part of what he is doing. And so as we look ahead, we don't have to know the future and know what it holds because we know who holds the future. And so today we can look at this passage of Scripture and just see how God was working in a wonderful way. Now the Gospel of Luke and Matthew, they both together in those first two chapters of each began to remind us of the events that were taking place there. This is the angel Gabriel who informs Mary of this uh, miraculous uh, conception, this virgin birth that will occur in Joseph as well, that he is to not be afraid to take Mary to be Uh, his wife because she is still pure and Mary and Joseph then because of this census and God can use heathen individuals yes God can use heathen politicians that ought to be encouraging to all of us today because we think of the word politician we get a negative connotation right away So God can use anybody, as he always has, to get them into Bethlehem, which had been prophesied 500 years ahead of time in Micah 5, 2, that this child would be born in Bethlehem. And so they make the journey down from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and there the Lord Jesus is born. What year was he born? Well, probably between 4 and 6 B.C., Of course, you know there is no zero on the calendar. It goes from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. Now, I'm not giving you a history lesson today, but it's important to understand that. Part of history we also understand is this, that Herod died in 4 B.C., in March of 4 B.C. We know that historically. And so how does all this line up? Well, it probably pushes the birth back more toward uh, the the sixth year, somewhere between 4 and 6 B.C. because of the events that are taking place along the way. On the eighth day, Jesus is taken for his circumcision, and he comes back according to the law. On the 40th day, he is taken to Jerusalem. He is presented at the temple. It is a time there for him, uh, a time of Mary's purification, that her purification days are over with, and that baby Jesus is presented for dedication. It's there we pick up Simeon. We are there we pick up Anna in the story there as we move toward the end of of Luke chapter 2. And so all of these things are taking place. They decide to, to settle into Bethlehem. You say, well, why? And how do you know they settled in? They didn't stay in the cave. Remember, it was just a, a grotto. It was a cave. It was an area uh, like the, for the keeping of sheep, the keeping of cattle, uh, donkeys, and that kind of thing. And so because this is the area of, of the patriarchs, remember but from the genealogy sermon that both Joseph and Mary had kin people that were in and around the town. Now, They weren't so keen in taking them in. You have to read that in the story there because no one said, hey, come stay with us, maybe because their houses were full. Everything in the inn seemed to be full, and yet there was a cave that was provided for the birth of the Lord Jesus. But afterwards, there's a new baby in the family. Listen, a baby changes everything. And there's this little baby and Mary and Joseph maybe then were welcomed in because this is, again, their line, their lineage, and and maybe into one of the patriarchs of their lineage, maybe their homes there, and so they obviously were in a house. Remember that Matthew tells us in the first 12 verses of this same chapter that when the wise men came who had seen his star months earlier, they came to the place that the star led them, the star again appeared went to the place stood over the house where the young child was i believe it to be a miraculous star because every house in bethlehem looks the same every house in jerusalem looks the same it was just that same look there i guess you could call them the original spec houses i don't know But regardless, it was the fact of the miraculous star leading them there. They presented to them their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so we find that all of this has taken place. As soon as they leave, we pick up in our passage today, and we find that the the wise men were warned, do not go back to Herod. Why? 
because Herod was an evil man. Herod would not have anyone else giving their worship to anyone else. Remember the wise men said, we have come to worship him. Herod thought he was the only one to be adored and worshiped. And so the wise men were in threat for their lives here. And so uh, remember the angel appeared to them and said, go another way. Chances are they probably could have gone down by the coastal way and went up uh, on, on the coast of the Mediterranean and made their way back that way. We don't know for sure, but they went a different way. Uh, it, it is there that we pick up the fact that there's another dream. And Joseph gets that word from the angel in the dream, take baby Jesus take Mary and go into Egypt for right now because it's not safe here. Herod will try to take the life of this baby. Indeed, what does uh, Herod attempt to do? Herod says when he saw that he had been deceived by the wise men and that uh, and, and he had been tricked in that way as he viewed it, he said, I want you to go and I want you to kill all of the children that are at least two years old and under. You say, why two years? Because Jesus could have been somewhere in the neighborhood by this time let's say six to nine months old maybe a year but in order to make sure that you've covered the spectrum he says two years old and under and let's get the entire districts here of Bethlehem and of course a massacre took place of all of the male children to wipe out any rival that may have been coming his way now, all of this is taking us up to where we are right now today and the flight into Egypt. And so here's Joseph and Mary, and they're making their way into Egypt, a place that they probably have never gone. It's uncharted territory for them. It's rough. It's barren land, but they're making their way along there and just, just at, the, at the mercy of God to take them where he is leading them. Now, when you began to compare that to 2020, you couldn't see it coming. You many times didn't know what was going to take place. It's been a year where all of us have been challenged in many ways. Uh, we don't know, and quite honestly, the flip of the calendar has done nothing but change the date of the year uh, because we're still in the throes of this to many respects, though there is encouraging light that is out there. So as we began to think about this and we began to liken this unto the flight into Egypt and what took place and even Christmas. I mean, everybody gets excited at Christmas because uh, of the children, because of a celebration, because of gatherings, though family gatherings may have been few, maybe non-existent, maybe they were spectacular. I don't know what you may have had. But in the midst of all that, it certainly has been different this year. And so the flight into Egypt can, can represent a lot of things. When you look at Egypt in the Bible, it's usually referred to as a land of bondage because it was a place of bondage for the Hebrew children for 400 years. And so we could call it a land of bondage. But it was also a land of refuge. Remember, it was Joseph's brothers, Jacob's sons, who came to Egypt and their lives were spared, their family's lives were spared, and so it became a land of refuge. It's certainly a land of refuge as we look in uh, the life of Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus. So when we look at that and we see both ends of the spectrum here, you could ask yourself the question in comparing it to what we have been through and are going through now, uh, and maybe you say, well, I feel like I'm in Egypt. I mean, I'm in downtown Cairo right now. And you may feel that way. For you, it may feel like it's been a land of bondage. But for others, you're saying, I'm going to turn that and say it also has been a land of refuge. And we can choose to have the negative or we can choose to look to the positive. And 2020 is a new year and we're looking to better and greater things. And the fact of the matter is, regardless, there's some truths we can learn from this passage that regardless of the year, our God is sovereignly in control. 
So as we think about Christmas in Egypt today, what are some of those truths that we recognize that though Christmas came and then it went and all the festivities and the shepherds came and eventually the wise men came and now Jesus and Mary and Joseph have all gone down uh, to Egypt, uh, what, what has this got to do with us today? And it really it plays in here with the five truths that I want to point out to you. The first one is this. When we think about this particular flight into Egypt and where we are right now in our lives, especially on this first Sunday of the new year, it requires the necessity of faith. I want you to look at that one first, the necessity of faith. Now, the entire Christmas story is about faith. Mary and Joseph both had to have faith when the angel Gabriel appeared to them and said, Mary... You're going to have a child. How can I do that? I've not been with man. The Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you, plant within your womb, and you're going to bring forth through a virgin birth this child. You will not have been with any man, but it's a God thing. And Mary said, let it be according to your word. I want you to think about that. If God were to give you that type of directive, how many of us would have been willing to do that? Joseph you're going to take Mary to be your wife. And he's already thinking of how he's going to put her away privately because he loved her. He could have had her publicly stoned to death because of apparent unfaithfulness. And yet he did not choose to do that. And he said, I'm going to put her away privately with a bill of divorcement. And you say, well, I thought they were just engaged. They were betrothed, which was official. And it would have had to be a divorcement. And so we find that Joseph then was told in the dream, Mary is pure, and she will bring forth the Messiah, the Christ child, and you will be the adoptive father. You will raise the Lord Jesus. Listen, there ever been a time as parents you didn't feel up to the task? How do you think Mary and Joseph felt? You're raising the Son of God. And we're raising up. Uh, men and women as they come through our homes and we don't know what it's going to be but it's the same necessity of faith that Mary and Joseph had that we have to have today so Joseph receives that dream he receives that word and he says I'm going to do it I'm going to do it and that's exactly what he did it requires the necessity of faith but remember after the shepherds are gone months later when the wise men finally come because they've been on this journey from persia and they make their way down and now they've left immediately because of what is going to take place here and the soldiers are going to be dispatched he's told you need to leave immediately and take mary and joseph what does he do the bible says and immediately during the night, he got up, left everything, and went out. Now, the first response for most Christians today would be, I need to think about that. I need to pray about that. Now, we, we, that means, really, I'm not sure I want to do it. I'm not sure it's practical to do it. I'm not sure I can do it. I'm not sure I ought to do it. I don't think I even want to do it. So I'm going to pray about it. Well, when God's spoken, number one, you can pray all you want to, but he's not changing his mind. When God has spoken, we have one option, and that is obedience. And not to do so is disobedience, and that's in every area of our life. That's to be faithful in the midst of a coronavirus. It's to be faithful in the times that we're going through, uh, through our attendance, through watching, whether online or in person, through our giving, through our support of missionaries and missions and things that we're doing. That in regardless, in good times or bad, and to see us through because there, there's good, there's light at the end of the tunnel. We know that for sure, but it's the necessity of faith. Think about Joseph's riding out. Probably Mary is on a donkey. She is holding baby Jesus, and they're going. You know, they don't have headlights on donkeys, and it's the middle of the night. There are no street lights, and the stars are shining bright. I don't know what God did. Maybe the, the light, the stars shone bright, brighter for them as they went by night. No light. The moon was out shining, maybe brighter. The same God who put the Bethlehem star in the sky can make the moon shine for them along the way. 
It could have been just a, a little path this wide. Mary, have you ever seen the moon shine so bright? We can just see our way. It's as if God's leading us. He is. But you know what they had to do? They had to get up. They had to get on the donkey, get their few things together, and leave. But they did so immediately. You see, the year may have changed, but there still is the necessity of faith in our life. And so for us today, we have to walk by faith. Now, this is not a time to kick into neutral. This is not a time to say, well, nobody's doing this and nobody's doing that. Nobody's doing the other. So I can feel footloose and fancy free and I can do whatever I want to. And there's no real expectations and all these kinds of things. We have one to please and that's the Lord God above. And we're to be obedient to him, and it requires the necessity of faith to do what we can do. Some of our doing is done in a different way, but we continue to do it to his honor, to his glory. So there, even after Christmas here, and there's the, the flight into Egypt, it requires the necessity of faith. There's a second thing, and that is you'll be reminded as we go into this year that there's still the continuance of evil the continuance of evil. Christmas didn't do away with evil, if you haven't noticed already. Evil began in heaven, of course, as, as Lucifer decided he was going to rebel against God, and he was kicked out of heaven, and a third of the angels were kicked out of heaven with him because they were aligning themselves with him. He was forever cursed throughout all of eternity, and guess what? He has a guest room that will be furnished in the pit of hell in the lake of fire. Amen. That's one guy I don't want to see anymore or his imps or anyone else because we won't be tempted in that day. So he's cursed forevermore. But sin's been around since the very beginning, since the Garden of Eden, since the fall of man. And sin has always continued, and that's what we find here in this life. We see King Herod. King Herod was already evil. He was already wicked. How evil was he? I'm hearing some of you ask. Well, I'm glad you did. Dean Farrar, a 19th century British scholar, said this about him. His whole career was red with the blood of murder, deaths by strangulation, deaths by burning, deaths by being pulled in two, deaths by secret assassination, confessions forced by utter, utterable unutterable un torture how's that acts of insolent and inhuman lust the survivors during his lifetime were more miserable than the sufferers herod killed three of his own sons caesar augustus once declared it was better to be herod's hog than a son even when he was preparing to die he gave a command to his sister and her husband that when i die I want you to kill all of the leaders of the country here because I want there to be mourning that is assured. Now, fortunately, they did not carry through with that command once he died. But this is the evil type of person that he was. Oh, what was this evil? It was pride. It's the original sin, the original sin from uh, Lucifer in heaven, the original sin of Adam and Eve. They wanted to be like God. God knows in the day that you eat of this fruit that you're going to be like him and you're going to know all these things. And, and, of course, pride led them to do it. Pride will lead us to do all kinds of things. And so uh, we know from Proverbs 8, 13, that God hates pride and arrogance. Proverbs 16, 5, every proud in his heart is an abomination to the Lord. From the very moment the wise men came and asked, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Herod, Herod was deeply disturbed that there was a rival out there somewhere and, and under the, his title and his authority that had been given to him by Rome. And so pride says, I'm going to do away with this particular person. And he says to the wise men, well, when you have found the child, he couldn't bring himself to say the king because of his pride. When you have found the child, uh, but bring me word back, and I too will uh, come and worship him yeah right there was no worship going to take place he was actually going to have him killed of course along the way like he had done so many there and it was nothing to him to be able to carry this out he was going to eliminate him 
The same pride. Can, can you think of this? What did pride cost him? Pride cost him that which he didn't see in a special star, which he didn't hear even when the scholars came and said in the Torah, it says that this is where this child is going to be born. The very fact that they came and told him and Bethlehem was not that far away and they could, he could have gone there. He missed everything about the Christ. He missed him all along the way. You say, well, what a wicked, stupid man. Is it any more stupid to know everything we know about Christmas today and not choose the Christ child as our Savior? To know about the story, to know everything that we know today, and every year we learn more and more and more, and yet we can push him aside. See, the continuance of evil can just continues on. Now, historians tell us that the, the prophecy that Jeremiah spoke that he alluded to here, at Ramah, Ramah was as far north of Jerusalem as Bethlehem is south. And so we're talking about a radius here and a circumference maybe that would reach out to 20 to 25 miles. It's estimated that 6,000 babies were killed. 6,000 male children who were killed. Now we can't watch the evening or morning news or get it any other time without seeing something evil. Just when you think evil has hit a limit and it can't get any worse than this, it just happens again. We're all affected by evil. We're affected by evil every time we look in the mirror. Because we have the sin nature within us. Maybe we could cry out as the scholars did, oh, oh wicked man that I am. And we could realize the fact that that same evilness can take us down a road away from the Savior or it can take us down a road that leads us to the Savior. We hear about it every day of the murders, of the child abuse, of the spousal abuse, of the human trafficking of children and women, uh, the murders and uh, the lies, the cheating, the scandals. It's just the wickedness and the evilness of men. See, Christmas didn't do anything. You can dress up a town, you can dress up a city, you can dress up a house, you can dress up a person, but you can't take away the evil nature. You see... There was a continuance of evil. But there's a third thing, and that is the curse of suffering. Maybe that brings it home a little bit more because people have always asked that age-old question, why do people have to suffer? Why do people have to suffer? Why does God allow suffering? Now, first of all, in that statement is this, God owes me a good life. That's really what we're saying there, that suffering shouldn't be in the world. But when we look at what we have done in rebelling against God through our sin nature that we have and wanting our way that starts from the earliest of a child, wanting to grab that toy or wanting to stay awake when you're wanting them to sleep, when they're wanting you to get them up and feed them, all those kinds of things, it begins to be exhibited, that type of selfishness, and it just gets worse as it goes through life, especially if it is not checked. The curse of suffering. Jeremiah had prophesied this massacre that it would be huge suffering that would take place in your thinking of these mothers that are holding children. How old's your baby? Well, he's almost two. And his head is severed. Maybe the sword goes through him. Horrible suffering, unjust, and their crying and their lament is heard over the region. Unconsolable the death of a child like this so people ask the question why does God allow this suffering why did God allow that why did God say that it was going to take place maybe that is a good question well I'm gonna give you some answers that I think will help and it certainly helps me to see this when you take in the context of the entire Word of God first of all it simply shows us the result of our sins there is absolutely nothing except uh, we are desperately wicked. We are not basically good. We are basically evil. We are de the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's what the Scripture says. So when we recognize that, every day we have to check it in to the Master and say, Oh, God, keep my heart under your control. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your, in your sight. You're my strength and you're my redeemer. 
And so God sometimes just allows us to see what we'll do. People still ask him the question, why did God not step in on 9-11? He shows us how dastardly, wicked, evil man is without him. Why did God allow that, that drunk driver? Why did God allow? Don't blame this on God. It's the sin nature going rampant. God gave us the right to choose, and along with that choice is the responsibility for our choices. And we make those bad choices, and those choices hurt other people along the way. But it allows us to see how, how wicked that really is in the sight of a holy, completely pure, white, beaming, brilliant light of God because of who he is. Sometimes he allows suffering in our life for us just to see the results of sin. You know, if we didn't feel anything, then we'd simply be numb to it. If you have to go to the dentist and you get a tooth filled and, you know, they, you come back and, you know, everything, you feel like it's drooping back down to here, you know, when you get out. And, and it's just numb. But you try to eat something, you can chew up your tongue, you can chew up your lip. Listen, that numbness is there to, type, to really protect you, but it's just there to keep you and tell you that to keep you from doing what you could do otherwise. You know, we've become quite numb to abortion in America. Well, it's the law. Just take away millions of lives. Every life is important. Every life matters. Every life a creation of God and every life is important. So we cannot become numb to the murder of lives any more than the murder of 6,000 innocent children back 2,000 years ago. Maybe pain and suffering also can allow us, help us to learn from, about God. You see, if God didn't allow us to suffer at times, we would never be able to feel his sufficiency. That's why Paul says, I, I know that when I am weak, then I am strong. He is the one who sees me through. He is the one who gives me life and he gives me health and, 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 and all that I have. And so he, he's, my, he's my defense. He's my sufficiency. My God has supplied all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Could you say that? It reveals, our, our suffering just reveals that he's there. He picks us up. He washes us off. He cleans us up. And he reminds us of whose we are. Perhaps he allows some suffering because it helps us to help others. No one can help someone else as much as someone who has suffered in that way themselves. No one can help someone else with cancer as much as those who have gone through cancer, those who have sustained the loss, those who have, have felt the pain of, of a family member uh, going away. Uh, all the different things that we could begin to list, a person who's been through that. So they're not just empathizing, they're really able to sympathize. And so sometimes God allows us to go through things that we can help others who will come along who will also be suffering. But also pain and suffering allows us to consider eternity. Revelation 21 says, I'll tell you about a day when there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more sickness, there'll be no more death, for the former things have gone away. Listen, that's a great place for an amen. amen. If you've ever suffered, if you've ever lost a loved one, if you've ever felt the pain of, 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 of denial and all the things that you can feel in your life and betrayal, Listen, it's great to know we're going to one day be in, in, the, in the presence of perfection. So when we look back at the Garden of Eden and we see all the sinful uh, behavior and the curse that came across humanity here, uh, the curse of suffering is still there. As long as there's life, we will not get better and better. You look at the news. Listen, I'll challenge you. You look at the news 10 years ago and you tell me if it's not worse today. And 10 years ago, it was worse than it was 10 years before that. And we just become, we'll just continue to go down and down and down until Jesus comes again. So it reminds us, it's going to be the continuation of suffering. That's not to gloss over it. That doesn't minimize the pain that's there when we lose a loved one, when we lose uh, someone. And all of that, the, the suffering, the curse of, of because of sin, was sickness, it's sorrow, it's death. It's all these things that never took place until Adam and Eve sinned. 
But because of that, it is upon us all. But there's a fourth thing I think we can see in this passage, and that is the prospect of hope. We find here that Joseph spoke to, was spoken to by God in a dream and said, go take Mary and baby Jesus, go to Egypt, and they went. Why? Because the prophecy, again, had to be fulfilled. Hosea 11.1 1 says, out of Egypt I have called my son. We read that in verses 13 through 15. We're reminded of the fact that because of that, uh, Jesus would be called out of Egypt. Now, it said that they went down into Egypt, in not, m- maybe as far as Cairo. Hey, I want to give you something that will blow your mind. When you think about Egypt, you think about the pyramids. You know, you could actually get lost around the pyramids. <laughs> but you get, you're at the pyramids, and you're seeing that. These are the, when you see those pyramids today, Moses looked at those pyramids. When you see those pyramids today, you can know that if Mary and Joseph took little Jesus that far, they saw the pyramids too. Just, just kind of puts things in perspective. When we visited back in 2010 with our group for Israel and, and Egypt, first of all, we saw those pyramids, but we also went to some Coptic churches that were the church of the flight into Egypt where it was believed that Jesus had come with Mary and Joseph there, and there's several different of those around, but the main one that that we had an opportunity to go to. You see, here's the point, that even in the bleakest of times, there's prospect for hope. If you don't have hope, you can't make it. What is it that sees the prisoners of war that are in places of bondage and all they're going through to be able to get through? It's the hope of a better day. It's the hope of release. It's the hope that somebody's coming to get them out of that place. It's a prospect of hope. It's interesting, in the bleakest of times that we have a God who comes through and he will give us hope. We need hope today. Not just in this day of of a virus, we're in the day of cancer, in the day of loss, in the day of of abandonment, and and all the things that we may happen to go through. But he says, I'm going to give you hope. Why? Because I know, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. You see, here's what we learn, a prospect of hope. That just when we get to the point that we don't know that we can take it, he says, I'm not going to allow more to come upon you than you're able to bear. But with the temptation, I will also make a way of escape. He did that for Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, and he'll do the same thing for us. Regardless of how bleak 2020 has looked at times and things continue to look, I want to say this. Our God is still on the throne. Regardless of how bad it is, he has never abdicated his power to somebody else. He will continue to fulfill every one of his prophecies as he did through thousands of years to get the Christ child here in the very town, in the very way to be born. He is continuing to work out that plan on this side until he comes again. And the prospect of hope is that any moment Jesus could split the skies, he's up there and we will go to be with him. And that's going to take place before the tribulation here on earth of all those that have been left behind. So while we see him, your neighbor who is lost will not see him. Other people will still, if it's a Sunday, will still come to church. If it's Saturday, they'll still go to church on Sunday because they don't know anything has taken place and we will be gone. It's the prospect of hope. It's the coming uh, of the uh, 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 is coming again for the redeemed and he's going to have ultimate victory. Why? Because he said I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be the friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm going to walk with you. That's what we learned about this flight into Egypt, the prospect of hope. But there's one more thing I want you to see. And that is the assurance of providence. In verses 19 through 23, after Herod has died, the angel again appears unto Joseph and said, Herod's dead. You can go back to Israel now. But understand that his son, Archelaus, is the one in charge, and he was known to be as bitter. He was one who had survived the other sons being killed, and he was the one on the throne. So don't go back to the area of Bethlehem. It's too close to Jerusalem. And so they didn't go back into Judea. They went up into Nazareth, which is beside the Sea of Galilee there. And there is where 
they would be for the next 28 years at least of their life until Jesus now goes at the age of 30 into ministry. We don't know about those silent years. We don't know all that took place. We know at the age of, of 12, he was in the temple. He was hearing the, the scholars speak. He was asking questions. How would you like to have Jesus ask you a question? You say, well, he was only 12. He was eternally old. He had been around forever. And he's asking questions. But we don't know anything really from there until the age of 30 when he comes into ministry. But it just shows you that we have the assurance of providence. It's these people who are out there thinking, well, there's, there's no God, it's, there's no heaven, there's no promise of all these, there's a bunch of, they're just ludicrous to believe all of these things. The very fact of fulfilled prophecy, of fulfilled history, of God doing what he said he was going to do at a perfect time, in a perfect way, and he fulfills those prophecies, prophecies gives us every reason to believe that he, we have the hope of a, a future that will be fulfilled and eternity with him one day. So regardless of what 2020 has been, regardless of how bleak it is, when you think about a flight into Egypt and Christmas in Egypt, you need to think about the fact that you've got a prospect of hope and you've got assurance of providence that God's on the throne, that he knows your life and you're just as important to him as anybody else on the face of this earth and he is going to see you through if your heart is given over to him. But we have to be reminded of the continuance of evil that every day our heart could be moved away from him, and so we need to report for duty. First thing, Lord, thank you for a night's rest. I'm reporting for duty. Lead me through this day because my heart, my sin nature is still here. I've been saved from my sin, but the sin nature is still, still present. And that's why Paul said that every day I'm, I, I find myself doing what I shouldn't do, and I don't do what I should do. And he says I'm still battling with that, and we still battle with that. So there's the continuance of evil, and yes, there will be suffering, and we'll, we'll suffer some ourselves. But there's the prospect of hope, and there's the assurance of God's providence that he's going to work everything out. He is going to work everything out for our good, for his glory. For all things work together, all things, even bad things, will work together for good for those who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purposes for our good, for his glory. So what about it today? When you look at this passage of Scripture, could you say, well, you know, I never thought that would kind of come out of this passage of Scripture, but I'm, I'm glad it did. That even Mary and Joseph and Jesus, Jesus faced some hardships, but the Father was in charge, the Heavenly Father, and he was moving. And just as he moved in that way, over and over again, appearing to Mary and Joseph, appearing to Joseph, appearing to Joseph, and God spoke and God continued. God still speaks today, and he reveals his will, and he says, look, get on my plan, follow my will, and you will be the happiest. You don't have to know everything out there. As a matter of fact, I'm going to save you a little bit of heartache. I'm not going to show you the future. You know the generalities of what's going to take place, but I'm not going to tell you how it's going to end. I'm not going to tell you if you're going to live long enough to be here for the rapture. I just want to surprise you. He might surprise us, and we may be in that number that goes before we have to go to the funeral home. But regardless, my body may go to a funeral home, but I'm already gone because that's the assurance I have in his scripture that everything he's ever said has, is, and therefore will come true. How about you today? Is your confidence in him do you have a prospect of hope? Or maybe you find yourself just kind of just going through these times. Listen, God's saying, I, I, I want to bring my church through this time, and I'm going to bring them through, and they're going to be stronger than ever, and the real church is going to stand, and the real church is going to be who they need to be, and we're going to come through it shining as gold. How about you in your life today? And those that may be watching, those that may be here, do you know Jesus as Savior? And if not, why not? And why not today? Is your life totally given over to him? If not, on this first Sunday of the new year, say, Lord, I want to trust you like Mary and Joseph did. I want, to, I want to be open as you lead in my life to do just exactly what they did, immediately saying, I'll do it. That's what God expects us to do in this year of 2021. Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you for your word today and how we can learn from this passage of Scripture about that we need to be open to you regardless of what is transpiring all around us. Even in the times we go through here and around the world, the evil that's around us, the sin and the sickness and the suffering that's around us, thank you that you're ultimately in control. And you show us how really desperate we would be without you. But you also give us a prospect of hope and a future deliverance because of your providence. Lord, I pray that today, if there are those listening today, those that are watching, those that are here that have never truly given themselves to you, that right now they would simply, before you, say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, and I've sinned against you. Please forgive me of my sin. I believe you died for my sin when you died on the cross. Please forgive me and make me your child and give me the strength to live my days for you. And Father, for that one and others today who may say, God, on this first Sunday of the new year, I can let the past and I can let 2020 be that which has simply been a a land of bondage, but also could look at it as a land of refuge time of refuge in my life and and now i'm going to spring into 2021 ready to serve you like never before because you're still on the throne and because you still expect the same out of us god we're going to serve you with all this within us so lord as hearts are dedicated and rededicated today resurrendered to you lord may this be a great year before you in jesus name amen as we stand for our time of invitation If you would like to help support ministry at West Asheville Baptist Church, you can do so by visiting our website, westashevillebaptist.org, to give online, or by calling the church office at 828-253-9824.